Hello, I'm Malcolm Hazlitt. To defame, malign, slander or to injure by speaking ill of or attempt to destroy a reputation by open and direct abuse. Well, we're talking about that with our very special guest and we meet the first person in SA to have contracted coronavirus through community transmission. And that's next on Our Time. Hello again and welcome to Our Time. Although that opening sounded quite heavy, uh, our very special guest is Cassini Yenge, who is a young sports car, uh, sports star, not a sports car. Welcome to Our Time. <laughs> Sorry about that funny opening, but um, the reason I said that at the beginning is because you've encountered a whole lot of rubbish in your career as a sportsman, mm -hmm. and we'll talk about that in a minute, but let's talk about some positive stuff to start with. So, you're how old? 22. The thing that's interesting about you, you're a mix of father and mother, obviously, because you're yeah. their son, Yeah. but mum comes from... England. Dad comes from... South Sudan. And they met... Here in Adelaide. And they had you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amazingly. Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of what's caused the issues, isn't it? The fact that you have, I guess, a chocolate coloured skin, if that's an appropriate thing to say. Yeah. It always bewilders me, though, that people have to see a skin colour. They call me white, but I'm pink. <laughs> and they call you chocolate, but really, you've just got a nice suntan yeah. to yeah. me. Yeah. The thing that everybody's jealous of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So tell us about your life as a sportsman now. So you've gone through your education, obviously. Did mm -hmm. you fall into playing soccer as a school kid? Um, I did in the schoolyard. Um, I didn't pick it up playing for a club until I was quite old, actually, which was around 12 years of age. Usually you start playing soccer quite a lot younger. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I played in the schoolyard and I played a little bit in primary school, but it wasn't really until I went to high school where I started to pick it up. Uh, what is it? Is it just the love of... Uh, uh, kicking, handling the ball. Well, you don't handle, do you? No, no hands unless you're a goalkeeper. Is that why you've got the hair like that? So <laughs> yeah, it helps me with the heading. <laughs> Bit of a cushion on the top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, when did you start seriously looking at it, though, as a career? How old were you? Um, pretty quickly, actually. Um, I started playing and I got really good in a very short period of time. And uh, I had uh, people around me that said, you know, if you want to try and make it to become a professional, then go for it. And so pretty quickly, probably in my first or second year of starting to play, I realised that, yeah, I could potentially become a professional. But they were mentors that were helping you or yeah. were they coaches? Yeah, coaches and my parents and family. Yeah, that's sometimes we forget what an important role parents play in mm -hmm. this. And the sacrifices too, because obviously they'd have to drive you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. When and I was feed younger. you. Yeah. How much do you eat a day? <laughs> now I eat a lot, um, yep. growing obviously and uh, training all the time. It's, I spend a lot of money buying food, for sure. So what's your typical intake of food a day? I know that's an odd question to ask, but I find it fascinating the amount that you need to eat to maintain your body. Yeah, um, when I started growing very quickly, I had a big growth spurt about two or three years ago. I used to eat plenty of food all the time and now I have to kind of watch what I'm eating um, so I don't go overweight or I don't weigh too little and uh, got to make sure that I'm getting like the right nutrients in after training to like replenish my muscles so I'm ready to go for training the next day. So who looks after that for you? Well, mainly me right now. Uh, me and my mum helps me a lot. But you cook a lot. Yeah, I do. I do. Your favourite dishes are? I like cooking a lot of chicken and fish. And where did the cooking expertise come from? Was it family? Um, yeah, I think for sure. My mum taught me a lot of things growing up and there was often times where she would be at work or my father would be at work and me and my brother would be hungry, so we would just kind of experiment in the kitchen ourselves. <laughs> oh, dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> Eggs are always good. Yeah. Um, so in the morning, what would your breakfast be, generally? I usually have uh, oats in the morning or um, scrambled eggs. It just really depends how early I get up and how With much time With fruit I have. in the oats? And stuff. Yeah, yeah. I put fruit in the oats and milk, obviously, and uh, I cook it in the microwave. Where would we be without a microwave? <laughs> yeah. And lunch? Uh, lunch, for lunch? Yeah, uh, not so much anymore. I'm trying to kind of watching my weight um, because now I'm a big lad. Um, I put on a lot of weight and I carry a lot of weight and obviously if I want to run quick on the field, I can't be too heavy. How tall are you? Um, 188 centimetres. Oh. So I used two. to be that tall once <laughs> in my mind. Yeah. Um, so you're a million dollar man. That's the extraordinary thing about you. Just explain what that means. Uh, 
it's I'm not really a million dollar man. I'm just another person. You are, but if you were traded up to another club, eventually, yeah, that's the sort of money they'd be looking at. Ah, uh, yeah, potentially. Um, depends on the club and what they well, value me. Well, first of all, how does this work? Because I don't fully understand how I mean, it happens in Aussie rules football as well. People are sort of traded amongst clubs. Yeah. Um, is that because you want to go to another club and your initial club has sort of sponsored you and put money into you and this is how they get their money back to train others like you? Is that yeah. how it works? Yeah, for sure. Well, um, Adelaide gave me an opportunity to be a professional footballer. And oh, sorry, and we haven't said who you play for. Yeah, I play for Adelaide United um, mm -hmm. in the Hyundai A-League. Um, so they've uh, given me the opportunity to be a professional footballer and put a lot of time and effort into coaching me and training me so I've become a good player. So, so yeah. you would basically go from that club, if you're climbing up the ladder, to another club that has a higher profile, perhaps For in sure. Europe? Yeah, yeah. Where would you go? Yeah, well, uh, I've always had the dream of playing in Europe and the best players always play in Europe. But there's other steps that you could take to get there, lots of different countries and lots of different leagues. And how does that make you feel, that leaving home? Because you're obviously a close-knit family. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I'm excited and if I, when I do leave or if I do leave, um, I can't wait really. I suppose it's not, it's not when, it's really, it's not if, it's when, yeah. really, isn't it? Yeah, that's probably more but What's the lifespan of a, of a sports star in soccer, uh, like it's, to play? Yeah, well, you start playing quite young. There's some people that start playing professionally at 16 years of age. Um, for me, I didn't start playing professionally until I was 20. Oh. Um, and this, the span of careers is getting bigger and bigger with all the equipment and all the stuff that people have to recover better and feed their body better, all the science and stuff behind it. Players are staying on and playing for longer. So the advice that you're being given through the club and the training, you've got a bit of a, a travel because you live near the beach but you're training up at... Elizabeth. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. what's that, an hour's trip a day? Uh, it, it was, it used to be, but Depends now with the, the new expressway, <laughs> <laughs> with a new expressway, you can yeah. get there pretty quickly. It takes about 45 minutes. Right. Yeah. But it's still, it's still sort of that time, you know, 45 in the morning, 45 at night. It just builds up. Yeah, it it's does. time that you don't have. What do you do in the car? Uh, I listen to a lot of music and uh, my favourite artists and stuff like that. And sometimes music becomes too much. I listen to podcasts and try to educate myself. Right. Is your whole mind, though, focused towards your career? Is it like every waking moment that's what you're thinking about or can you get out of that mindset? I try not to. I try not to think about my football all the time. I try to have my time away from football. Yeah, and but, family. Uh, yeah, and family. Yeah. Spend time with my family. But um, everything in my world kind of revolves around football. So yeah. in a certain way, I'm always thinking about it. We'll be back in a tick to talk some more to Cassini and we'll show you what he looks like on the field. In a tick, we'll be back. And welcome back to our time. Our special guest is Cassini, fabulous sports star of the soccer field. <laughs> and we've got some shots of you. And I said before when I had a look at this, you look so young, it's unfair. Yeah. Look at that. Flinders Uni, it says there. Were you playing for Flinders? No, I was playing for Adelaide United, but they're oh, but one they're of sponsored, our major of course, sponsors. Yeah. Sponsored by. And how important is that? So this next shot that we've got of you um, in these lovely red outfits, where was that? Uh, that was at our home stadium, at uh, Cooper Stadium, mm -hmm. uh, against Brisbane Moor, I believe, and uh, I assisted one of the goals in it, me and my good mate Craig Goodwin, celebrating. Okay. And this one in yellow? Uh, this one in yellow was uh, away in Perth, actually, and um, I scored a goal and did a bit of a dance as a celebration. It was a good photo that was taken <laughs> by our photographer. <laughs> and this one? Uh, that's from the same game also, but uh, me just dribbling with a ball. Right. And this last shot, this is the one that really I was referring to at the very beginning of the show. Mm -hmm. What happened? Uh, so basically what happened is that I scored my first goal for the club. Um, it was away against our rivals, Melbourne Victory, mm. in uh, Melbourne, at, Melbourne at Marvel Stadium. And uh, I scored a goal and I leaped over the, the billboards and uh, did a celebration and kind of confronted the Melbourne Victory fans, rubbed it in their face a bit. And what happened then? Oh, I guess uh, as a result of my celebration or the way I interacted the with the fans, really. yeah, they yeah. weren't they weren't happy with it, and they decided to racially abuse me on social media. So, although this is sort of relatively new, to my knowledge, 
This was almost encouraged in the old days amongst players. It wasn't necessarily for skin colour. It was just a way of disarming the people that were playing against you. Um, where do you feel this sits within that logic of coaches encouraging, in the past, coaches encouraging people to vilify wherever possible to discouraged? Yeah, I know in, in sport, for sure, there's a bit of a, like talking smack and stuff like that on the field to yep. try get your opponent off his game, but yep. that shouldn't come down to anything that's racial or anything like that. Um, yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? Because, as I said at the beginning, you know, we're all people. We're all made of stardust. That's what I say to everybody. Yeah. I feel, it, I sort of feel a bit sorry for the human race that, that we, we have this need to put people down because we are not there. Mm -hmm. do, you think, do you think that's the reason this is happening? Do you think it's the fans, they, they don't really understand that everyone's a human being, everyone's sort of started in the same place, we're all born, we all breathe the same air, we all drink the same water eventually, goes up, comes back again. Mm -hmm. um, why do you feel people need to do this? I, I'm not sure actually. I, I'd love to speak to these people who are making these comments and try to understand where their head is at and why they're thinking and why they want to make these type of comments towards people. Do you think they're just not thinking? Yeah, a bit of not thinking, a bit of not having the knowledge that it could hurt someone or yeah. maybe what they're saying is wrong. What actually hurts you? What, what's the feeling you get when you get that? Um, it's a bit of disappointment because uh, we live in a world that if there's a lot of, mo especially the Adelaide, the city is very multicultural and there's mm. a lot of people from different cultures and uh, we should all embrace each other and one another and we're all the same. You know, I'm just a human. I was just a kid once. I had a dream of playing professional football and now I'm here. And I think also professionals and uh, sports person in particular put on this kind of pedestal where um, people think that they should be able to uh, cop everything, like people can abuse them and that they don't have those feelings and it doesn't actually filter through with them, but it does. I'd be saying welcome to show business because yeah. that's what people in show business get all the time. Mm -hmm. People either love you or hate you yeah. and for some reason feel some need to let you know. Mm -hmm. Who mm -hmm. cares? Yeah. <laughs> At the end of the day, do you just... Who cares? Yeah, I, will, I try to try to obviously not let it affect me on the field or uh, affect my team, um, so I try to keep my headset straight and focus on the game, but... I also try to speak up about it because I want there to be change. I want there to be a world where we don't see each other for the differences in their colour and I want mm. everyone to be equal. Now, if you had a foreign accent and were difficult to understand, the reaction may be because of that, but you're not. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I mean, that's the whole point. We are all the same. Yes. Yeah. exactly yeah. the point. Yeah. So uh, within the club, there's a fair mix of different backgrounds, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, oh, the whole league, there's lots of different nationalities and people that are coming from overseas or people that are born here that are playing uh, Is here. that because soccer is played so universally and therefore people come from everywhere? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Mm. Um, yeah, there's a lot of different cultures that uh, come into the game and football is played everywhere in the world. It's not like Aussie rules where it's only played here in Australia. So mm. there is a lot of different cultures and diversity. Mm. Is that what drew you to it in the first place and not Aussie rules? Um, no, not really. I, I played Aussie rules growing up as a kid as well. Oh, OK. Um, yeah, I don't just know. Just chasing that ball. Yeah. Anywhere it goes, just chasing <laughs> that ball. Yeah. <laughs> When, you, uh, when the game is over, though, have you thought of phase two of your life? Have you thought of where you're going to go next? Yeah, I'm thinking about it all the time. I'm not sure what I want to do. I or, think you should be yeah. a sports broadcaster. Yeah. yeah. Really. Well, you're well-spoken. You look good. Your knowledge of, you know, your background is good. I think um, at this point of your life, you do have to think about what you're going to do after. For sure. And you can still be involved in sport. Mm -hmm. um, admittedly, you're observing more, but your background knowledge of how you got there. I find it fascinating, the diet, the exercise. How long a day do you spend training, physically training? Uh, physically training on the field, uh, probably anywhere between an hour to two hours, but also in the gym and um, at the training facility doing a lot of other stuff like massage and recovery techniques. Uh, if you're in the gym, is it weights or is it... Um you know, uh, what's the word, exercising against yourself. Uh, yeah, uh, we do do that. Depends. Uh, right now um, I do a lot of that. So I'm on the grinder, which is like a kind of like bike you use with your arms and uh, oh, also right. assault bikes and stuff like that. So, yeah, we use the gym to lift the weights but also conditioning for our body as well. Sure. Do you do a lot of running? Yeah. Well, on the pitch every day I'm chasing after the ball. So, yeah, I <laughs> yeah do, sure. Do a lot but of do you just run for the sake of running? 
Oh, it depends. Uh, they do. There is some coaches that like a lot of running without the ball. Yeah, like um, is your body trained to run, so to speak? Like, does running make you feel good? Is that what gets everything working for you? Yeah, yeah, I like running. I like running. Obviously, mm. when I'm on the field, I have to be able to run. I cover a lot of kilometres each game. So when I can uh, run with ease, I can spend more time in my head thinking about what I'm going to do with the ball actually at my feet instead of thinking about running. So, yeah. Is, so during the game, is it a mathematical thought process? If I do this, that'll happen, that'll happen? No, uh, is it really. just a game nah. of chance? No, nah, no, neither, neither. There is a lot of skill involved in football. I'd say it's probably one of the most skilled sports there is out there. And um, it's not just about running. It's not just about skill. It's a, a combination of the both. Mm. Well, I think your mum and dad have very, done a very good job bringing you up. You're a lovely young man. I really wish you all the best. Thank you very much. And thanks very much for coming and talking to us on our time. I hope that's been really interesting for you to meet this lovely young man. We have a very special guest next who is actually on the camera that's taking this shot at the moment. Again, thanks very much. We'll see you soon. We'll see you on the TV. Thank you. We'll, do. we'll be back. And welcome back to our time. As promised, please meet Alana Underdown. Hello. Hello. Nobody ever gets a chance to see you. No. Exactly. But you were literally on the camera yeah. before. Mm -hmm. Alana, the reason I wanted to talk to you is because you have had the coronavirus yes. and yeah. not a lot of people are having the opportunity to talk about the fact that they got no. it. So yeah. first of all, how did you get it? Alrighty, so I used to work in the Barossa at a winery and mm -hmm. unfortunately a group came who had contracted the virus and I worked with them. So You were looking after yeah, them? Yeah, I worked a couple yep. of shifts with them and yeah, a couple of days later, got the phone call. That was from the manager at the winery? Yep. And, and what happened then? You went for a test, obviously. Yeah, we went straight to get a test and then a couple of days later, got the phone call. So yeah. this would have been last March? March. Yes. And what were the symptoms? What did you feel first of all? What so, was the initial? So to begin with, it was just a classic cold. So just yep. sore throat, fever, just stuff like that. And, and you then, didn't think any of No, exactly. Of it? I was just, I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. And then a couple of days later, that's when I got quite sick. So I couldn't, couldn't do anything, just had to lay. Couldn't. So were you in bed? Yeah. And so you expressed to me before the mm -hmm. feeling of lifting your arms up was... Yeah, I, I couldn't do anything. If I, I would take, if I sat up, I would have to like regain my breath for like five minutes. I couldn't breathe properly. But, now, yeah. because it was new to the world at that mm. time, people didn't really understand what was going no. on. But of course, yeah. this program, like many others, was closed down for two months mm. altogether. And I had no idea this yeah. was happening to you. Yeah, exactly. Did anybody else know? Uh, yeah. yeah, my family, friends, but... But you yeah. hadn't been to the studio here between that time. No. So it never was sort of a contact situation mm. with the people here. Not or at here, uni but either. Oh, I did go to uni during that time. Oh, you did? Yeah, so unfortunately. So that was part of the uni yeah. closing down. Yeah. It was that your was, fault. That was me, yeah. Everyone went, whoopee, mm -hmm. no yep. more. <laughs> exactly, I put everyone in lockdown. So. No, but you, you were literally the first that was sort of discovered from that particular yeah. initial... Where did the people come from again, do you remember? Um, they were from Switzerland. Right. Yeah. And they were just tourists doing what yeah. everybody thought was fine. Exactly. It was just a group of 18 and I just happened to be working a couple of shifts with them. So. Right. Now, I haven't yeah. asked you this before, so yeah. I'm putting you on the spot. Alrighty. So when you see people that are going against having a vaccine, mm. how does that make you feel? Well... I think people don't under, like fully understand th th like how real it is, mm. and they don't understand that it's serious and the effects that it can have long term. So. And you did have longer yeah. term. Yeah. Just explain what that was. So for probably about a good nine months afterwards, every single day I'd get heart palpitations, and like it took me for a very long time to regain like my strength and. Do you yeah. feel you're back to normal now? Yeah, I think I yes, yeah. Yes, your personality is back to oh. normal again. <laughs> yeah, sorry. But, you know, uh, when we discovered this, we are really concerned because uh, you're one of the family and it's yeah. like having your family yeah. come down with something. Yeah, well... So yeah. talking about the inoculation or the jab, mm. which I think is an unfortunate expression, yeah. I don't know what you feel, but I think people talking about having the jab all the mm. time 
it implies being jabbed with yeah. something that it will be painful. Yeah. And I'm fully vaccinated and I felt yeah. no pain at all. Oh, that's great, yeah. So after the first injection, I felt for probably three hours the mm -hmm. feeling like I was getting the flu. Oh, OK. After the second one, I was a bit fuzzy in the head is probably the only way to yeah. describe it, like I had a bit of the flu for a day or so, but after that. So the people that are talking about maybe microscopic things being mm. put into our body and all that, what's your opinion? I don't personally believe that. But well, how would that happen? Yeah. It'd be very small. <laughs> yeah. And you're working here, what you're doing at uni, what course are you doing? So I'm doing Bachelor in Film and TV. Mm-hmm. You're yep. working on an interesting little project at yeah. the moment, which yeah. is? Which is for character performance. We're modelling a character, so I'm making a little record player. And so your hope in the future yeah. is to become? I would love to work on a film set, just sort of being on camera and lighting would be amazing. So being part of a crew on a program mm. like this, how has that helped you sort of understand yeah. how things work? Oh, it's been amazing, just to make connections and just to fully understand a bit more about the cameras and just to be How surrounded things by work. Them. Yeah, exactly. But it's also it's opened up a lot of the projects that everybody yeah. else, you've got a little posse of people Yeah, we do. Here. It's great. We all, we, we all catch up. Well, and we're going to meet a films. couple of them in, in yeah. a minute mm -hmm. because um, it, all precautions are being taken, even yeah. making a program like this with mm -hmm. checking in, with hand sanitising, with yeah. wearing masks and all of those sort of things. Uh, at what point did you feel, because we've sort of gone the big wave to start with, now we're on a second yeah. wave, did you think this was all going to happen again? Oh, yeah, I think so. I definitely think so. Do you, um, now because you've had, mm. because you've had that one bout of it, yeah. has that made you immune to what's happening at the moment with the Delta well, variant? I don't think so. I think um, I've still got some antibodies that will probably protect me a little bit, but I think that I can still definitely catch it. So the answer to that is? No, yeah, well, yeah, I'll definitely get vaccinated. Yeah, I think that's the positive message mm. that we need to spread to everybody. Yep. Um, it is frustrating when you have the best minds in the world working mm. on a vaccine to help us and people are saying, oh, I think I'll just wait and see if it's OK. Yeah. It's like, what are you waiting for? Yeah, you know, exactly. The whole world yeah. needs to get moving. Yeah. Look, thank you so much for coming to talk to us. Thank you. Um, what I'd like to do now, because mm -hmm. you've taken your mask off to do this, yeah. but a couple of the crew who are on the floor and mm -hmm. Cassini, who we talked to before, um, we'll just get everybody yeah. back in the set. Because yeah. what I've noticed with a lot of television programs is if you do see the crew, everyone's wearing masks at the moment. It's only us who are in front mm -hmm. of the camera that get an opportunity to take it off. Yeah. But... Yeah. Um, in South Australia, we've been quite militant to keep doing the right thing, so to speak, and we do feel really sorry for all of our friends in Victoria going through all of this for, what is it, the fifth, sixth time at the moment, mm -hmm. having to having to go through this total sort of lockdown situation. We've been very lucky here in South yeah, Australia. Yeah. The government has been at times criticised enormously but successfully mm -hmm. kept the virus down. So yeah. come, on, come on in, folks. Um, Cassini, come Hi. back and join us. I just wanted to show you all. Sorry, we're, wherever you like, but not there for a minute. Just our height difference. I thought I was tall at six foot eight, and look at you. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Um, how difficult, you can use my microphone, talk loudly into my mic. Yep. How difficult has it been for you to work on the floor? Because you're our floor manager. Hello, yes. <laughs> How difficult, How difficult yeah. with the mask? Yeah. No, it's been fine, honestly. It's the only time. The only time I think it ever has been is if you're doing something hard, like working out or something. Like it's fine. Yeah. yeah. It's just, it's part of life now. It is, and we're all, we've all sort of got used to it. Cassini, I know that um, you've got a black mask. On. It looks nicer than mine. <laughs> I'm amazed. I'm <laughs> amused. Look, colour coordinated. I've had to get something that suits my clothes. <laughs> Same as you. Um, for you, do you have to wear the mask much? Uh, yeah, when we're travelling interstate, we have to wear it all the time. Yeah. To play games and stuff like that. But while you're wo oh, you're working in the gym? Yeah, well, no, while we're working in the gym, we don't have to wear the mask. But we you've got to have all that spacing. Numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. We're usually in there in small numbers. For you, you have to talk into his mic loudly. Yeah, um, it's great. 
Because you've been out filming a lot. A lot, yeah. And have you been wearing the mask for all of that? Most of the time, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And we've, been, we've all talked about having, being inoculated eventually or uh, at this time. I just personally recommend that you all go out, get inoculated, then we can all go back to normal sooner sooner than later, hopefully. Thank you very much for sharing this time on Ad Time with us. Until we see you next time, keep yourself nice. Till then, bye.